Today on the Dragon Table, I'll be going over a tutorial on how to play Caverna, the Cave Farmers. If you've played Agricola before, you're going to see about half this game as very familiar, and the other half is some new mechanics. Uh, this is a Euro game. It is worker placement and resource management. Uh, it's from Mayfair Games and designed by Yu Rosenberg. Let's take a look. So this is what the main play board looks like in Caverna, and this is what your home board looks like. So this is what each player will be playing off of. The main board is going to be varied depending on how many players are in the game. You're always going to have these two pieces, which are separate, these are two separate pieces, um, because they say one to seven on both of them. Uh, this is the board that you use if you're playing with four to seven players. If you're playing with one to three, you'd flip it over. So it alters the, generally it alters the number of resources that are available. And if you're playing with like a lot of people, it will give you some more options. In addition, if you're playing with three, you add this strip, seven, this strip, five, you would add this, and six to seven, you would add this. So you're adding more options for more people or different options for smaller numbers of people. Your personal home board is where you're going to be placing tiles, animals, um, furnishing your cavern, and thereby getting your points that you're going to get during the game. Here's some ways that you can get points during the game, just to give you an overview at the beginning. You would get one point for every farm animal that you have. Um, and you could have multiples. Uh, you could have many, many, many of any of these animals. There's no restriction. Um, you have wild boar, donkey, dog, cow, and here we have two sheep. Um, you would get a point for each of these at the end of the game. If you're missing any one of these animals, you would get minus two per missing type of animal at the end of the game. This is green. And for every grain, you get half a point rounded up. So one grain would be one point, and two grain would also be one point. This is a vegetable. That will give you one point at the end of the game. You can also get rubies in the game. They will give you one point each at the end. Your worker pieces are dwarves that look like these round circles, and you'll get one point for each of these at the end of the game. You start with two. During the game, you're going to be filling your home board with tiles, and any unused space at the end of the game will give you minus one point. You'll also get points for the furnishing tiles that you've put down, the pastures, and the mines, and it'll say on each of those tiles how much they're worth, which you'll see farther into this video. There are also certain furnishing tiles that give you uh, bonuses at the end of the game, depending on which resources you have. You'll also get points at the end of the game for the amount of gold that you have, which looks like this. This would be two points. If during the game you ever can't feed your workers, you get minus three points. It's a begging token. This will sit in front of you, you cannot get rid of it, and it's worth minus three at the end of the game. So the way the game works is by worker placement, taking actions, and using your resources. It goes in a round-robin fashion. So let's say the first player is blue. He would place his token out and then take the action associated with that spot. Then the next person would go and take the action associated with that spot, and it would continue going around and around until everyone has placed however many dwarves they have available and taken the actions on those spaces. So let's take a look at some of the different parts that come with the game. There are many, many pieces to the game. It looks a little bit overwhelming when you first open the box, but it's really not too bad once you get used to it. Every player will get five total possible dwarves, although they start with two that they can use, and three stables. And that is their base of uh, stables that they can build and number of dwarves that they can have total by the end of the game. Each player can also get these nice little handy cheat sheets. This explains the harvest phase, which I will go over later. This explains how you can use rubies, and this card explains expeditions. These are some more resources that you can get during a game. These happen to be farm animals, and these are different resources. We've got donkeys, and sheeps, and cows, 
and wild boar. Over here we've got wood, which from a distance looks like cows. Um, don't get your cows and your wood mixed up. Uh, you also have stone, grain, and vegetables. And these containers do not come with the box. Uh, all you get with the box is a thousand uh, plastic bags, which I can't handle. So I go to the container store and I get all of my uh, containers that I keep everything in, um, for, especially, for, especially for games like this, at the container store. Plug. These little tokens represent food. They represent one food each. This is the starting player token. Whoever is the starting player, obviously, will get this token. And then these are tokens that are going to be used during the latter part of the game. They will be going onto these spots and then they'll be flipped over to see what happens that turn. Again, I'll go over that later. These are dogs. They count as um, animals at the end of the game. Obviously they are animals, uh, but they serve a different purpose than the other farm animals during the game. These are rubies and this is ore. These are armor tokens that are used for expeditions and they will also be used for the turn order of your individual dwarves. To be explained later. If you ever are running low or running out of resources during the game, you can use some of these multiplication tiles uh, in place of, uh, of different items. For instance, if you're out of stone, you can, if somebody's got a lot of stone or there's a lot of stone located on one of these spots, you can use one of these multiplication tiles to indicate that you have 10 stone. These are your money tokens. They're in denominations of one, two, and 10. These are some of the tiles that you'll be laying out on your home board. These obviously are meadow and field tiles or pasture and field tiles. And then there's also some tiles for using inside your, your, uh, your cavern. And all of these are double sided. So if you're looking for a particular tile and you can't find it, make sure that you flip it over to see if the tile you're looking for is on the other side. These are some of the other tiles that you can be placing out. These are obviously cavern tiles, caverns and tunnels that you'll be placing out on your board. Um, these ore mine tiles, just so you know, because it took me a while to figure it out, have double pastures on the other side. It took me like five minutes to find the double pastures because they're on the other side of the ore mines. When you start furnishing your cavern, you're going to be using these furnishing tiles and they all serve a different purpose but they will be placed on top of spaces that look like this. You get one to start with, and then the other ones you'll get throughout the game. So as I said before, you're going to be able to get furnishing tiles to lay down in your cavern during the game. Uh, these are the boards where the furnishing tiles will be placed, and these are going to be accessible to all players during the game. There will be a stack of dwellings here. Sometimes it's so high you need to make another stack off to the side just so you don't get dwelling spillage all over the place. Um, for all of the other tiles, only one will be available throughout the whole game. Uh, these boards that I'm showing you have two different sides. This side is the introductory side, and this side is the more advanced side. Uh, for this tutorial, I will be using the introductory side. So each space on the board uh, will, will give you the name of the tile that goes there and will also explain what that tile does. And they'll look like this when they're placed out. There'll be a whole bunch of them. Uh, in order to place a tile, you're going to have to pay the cost, which is located at the top. And then the bottom will show you the benefit. These are uh, dwelling tiles that will give you room for more dwarves. Uh, these are tiles that will give you benefits during the game. And these are mostly tiles that will give you scoring at the end of the game. You'll also notice that each tile uh, will have a little shield up at the top right corner, and that will note how many points it's worth at the end of the game. These tiles that have scoring at the end of the game uh, will have a uh, shield in a different location, and it'll be usually related to how many resources you have. During the game, at the beginning of each turn, you're going to be replenishing action spaces. Uh, any place that has a resource listed and then a little arrow tells you that that's how many resources need to get placed on that space 
at the beginning of each turn. If there is a number with another number in parentheses, it means that if there's nothing on this space, you put the big number down. So in this case, it would be two stone. But if there already are two stone on this space, then you would only place one instead. Here you would place one food. Here you would place one ruby. You would place three ore here, unless there already were ore, in which case you would place two ore instead. Three wood, two wood or one, two wood. And here you'd place one grain. If there's already any grain here, then you would place a vegetable instead. The other thing that will happen at the beginning of the turn is you'll place a new card out on whatever is the next open round space. So for round one, you'll be putting a card out. This is going to give you an additional action to play on throughout the game. And then for the next round, you'll place another card out and then another card will go out. So all of these are going to give you different options during the game. Uh, it's the same stack of cards that will be coming out, but they'll be coming out in a slightly different order each time. It's not hugely varied, but it varies a little bit. The first phase of the turn is placing your workers. So you would place your worker out and then take the action associated with the space. In this case, it would be to take the starting player token. So the blue would then be the starting player. Uh, they would take however many food tokens were on this space and they would also get one ruby and they would do all of that immediately. Then every player does the same thing with each of their dwarves and then the action phase is over. Once the action phase is over, all of your dwarves return home and you must have enough space on your board in order for those dwarves to come home. You start with room for two dwarves, so two of your dwarves will fit in this first cavern or this first dwelling space. And then after that, if you want more dwarves, you're going to have to build more dwellings in order for you to accommodate further dwarves. Then, depending on what turn it is, you will either have a harvest or you'll have a variation of a harvest. The first two turns, there is no harvest, so you can plan on that. Um, and then uh, you have a harvest, then you have a variation in which you just pay one food per dwarf, then there's another harvest, and then after that for the rest of the game, it's going to be randomized as to whether you have a harvest or a variation of a harvest. I'll go over the details of the harvest later, but it involves being able to take grain and vegetables from your board, uh, breeding your animals, and feeding your dwarves. Throughout the game, you're going to have a chance to get rubies, and rubies work kind of like wild cards. This is your cheat sheet that will tell you what the rubies can be used for. Um, they can be used on a one-to-one -one basis for most of the resources in the game, not including cattle. Cattle require one ruby and one food in order to acquire. There are also some actions that you can take on your home board if you pay a ruby. For instance, you could place a single meadow tile for the cost of one ruby. In your cavern, you could place one cavern tile for the cost of two rubies, or you could place tunnels for the cost of one ruby. So there are many different things that you're going to want to do with your home board during the game. Let's talk about the things that you can do and how you can accomplish them. If you want to place a meadow and field, for instance, like this, here's how you can do it. You could take the clearing action. You'd be able to take however much wood has accumulated in this space and then you could place one of these tiles. This side up, not this side. This side has a pasture on it, which requires a different type of action. This is a meadow and a field, and that's what you can place first. Another option would be to take the sustenance action. If you place that here, then you would take however much grain and vegetables have piled up here and then you'd be able to do the same thing. Place one of these tiles on your board. 
whenever you place tiles, they need to be adjacent to this home space. So if they're going in here, they need to be adjacent to this, these spaces, and out here, they need to be adjacent to this space. If you place a tile here, it may be hard to see, but there is a little space that says plus one food. Once you place a tile over that, you immediately get one food token, which then is a resource that can be spent during the game. Another option for placing a meadow and field is slash and burn, which is right here. You could place your meadow and field, and then you can sow the field. If you have either a wheat or a vegetable in your inventory already, you may place that out on the board, on the field, and if you do so, you would then place, in the case of grain, two more grain on top of it. If you use a vegetable, you would put a vegetable out, and then you would place another vegetable on top of it. You can only do this if you already have those items in your inventory. You cannot take them from the supply in order to sow a field. So I also want to point out that for each of these, it, and for many of these spaces, it says and or. So it means that you can do either of the actions here. So for instance, if maybe these two places, places had already been taken, but you still really want to put out a meadow and field, but you don't have any vegetables or grain, you can still take this action to put this tile out, you just would not be able to take the second action. Normally, you cannot have animals on a pasture. However, if you have a dog, a dog can watch two sheep. If you have two dogs, two dogs can watch three sheep. On a meadow space, you can have one more sheep than you have dogs. And there are no other animals that can be kept on that spot. If you don't have sheep, you don't have meadow space, and you just have some dogs, they can be anywhere. They can be running around in your cave. They're just like dogs in real life. You really have no control over them. So as I mentioned before, there's a difference between meadows and pastures. I'll do it like that so your two is face up. Um, a meadow, as I said before, can only have sheep on it as long as you have dogs. Pastures not only can hold two animals, but are also worth two points at the end of the game. So any two animals of the same type can be housed in a pasture. For instance, I've got two cattle in this pasture. You can increase that number by building a stable. If you build a stable, then you can put four animals in that spot. So if I built a stable here, I could have four donkeys. And like I said, there are some of those uh, duplicate tiles that I showed you earlier. You can use those instead of animals if you're getting um, a lot of animals clustered together. In order to turn a meadow into a pasture, uh, you'll have to use a card like this, um, sheep farming, where you would place your token here and then to pay two wood to turn a small meadow into a small pasture. This is also how you would build a stable by paying one stone. If you have two meadow tiles that are adjacent to each other like this, you can use a similar, and this is not the only card that lets you do this, I'm just using it as an example. You could pay four wood and turn this into a double pasture. It's worth four points at the end of the game, and it can hold four animals. If you build a stable, it can hold eight animals. Now over here, you might be able to see that there's a spot right here and a spot right here where if you place a tile over it, oops, you would get one boar. Now the caveat being, if you get this one boar, you need a place to keep it. You cannot keep it in a meadow, only sheep can be in the meadow. So you would have to have a pasture available to put the boar in, or you could place the boar inside this first dwelling. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I like to sleep with pigs too. Um, but this first dwelling has room for two dwarves and one pair of animals. So you could have your two dwarves and two boar in this first space if you don't have any pastures available at first. It's also a good option for managing animals later in the game 
and I'll go over that in a bit. If you want to furnish a space in your cavern, you need to have an open space like this. You start with one at the beginning of the game. You'll get a chance during the game to place additional tiles in your cavern. Here's another space, and this is a tunnel. You cannot put a furnishing tile on a tunnel. These are used for mines. Then on the initial board, you could put your worker down here, give yourself one dog, and then furnish a cavern by paying its cost at the top. This one is two wood and one stone, and then you would be able to place it on top of any open cavern space. To start with, they would need to be next to this first dwelling. There will be other cards that come up during the game that will let you furnish spaces other than just this one. You may also be able to see right here, there's a plus one food and a plus two food, food over here. When you place a tile down over that, you would get a one food token that you'd be able to spend during the game. And if you manage to get tiles up here, you would get two food tokens that you'd be able to spend. If you want to place these additional tiles, here's how you do it with the options that you have at the beginning. You could place your token on drift mining, which would give you however many stone have piled up here and would allow you to place one piece that looks exactly like this, which is a cavern with a tunnel, someplace on your board that connects to this an initial space. Here, 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 here. You've got a lot of choices. So let's say you put it there. Alternatively, you could place it on excavation. That would give you, again, how mu however many stone have collected here. And it would let you place the tile either in this position, which is the cavern and tunnel, or the cavern cavern spot, which you could also place in any position that is going to connect to your initial tunnel. If you want to build an ore mine, you're going to have to wait until the ore, ore mine construction card comes out, which is going to be during the first stage, so one of the first three rounds. Once this card is out, let's say it's right here, you can put your token on it, and you can place an ore mine. An ore mine must go down over two tunnels that are adjacent to each other. So it cannot go down over caverns like that or like that. It must go over two tunnels. So you would place that here. You would get plus three ore, as it says on the card. And if you get any donkeys later, you can keep one donkey in your mine. The second part of this card is an expedition, which I am going to explain later. If you want to build a ruby mine, you're going to have to wait until the second stage of the game. You can place your token here, and you place a ruby mine on one of the tunnel spaces, like that. That will give you four points at the end of the game. Now, if you have an ore mine constructed already, You have what's called then a deep tunnel, which is this part right here. If you place a ruby mine over a deep tunnel, in addition to placing that mine, you will also get one ruby for your inventory. Also on this space, ruby mining, you would get, if you place your token here, you would get however many rubies have been accumulating in this spot, and you would get an additional ruby if you have at least one ruby mine in your cavern. You can also keep a donkey in a ruby mine. So I mentioned expeditions earlier. Um, there are a couple of different ways to go on expeditions, but they are only going to be available once the blacksmithing option is out, which will be during the first stage. You would place your token here, and then you would pay one to eight ore. Let's say in this example, I have three ore. I would pay three ore, and this dwarf would get a three armor. He could then go on an expedition. He has three armor, and he's going on a level three expedition. What that means is if you look at your expedition cheat sheet, he can choose anything that is a armor of three or above, because he has an armor of three, and he'll be able to choose three items because it's a level three expedition. If he was a level four dwarf, 
he would be able to choose from the four and up choices, but still only choose three of those because it's a level three expedition. And you can only choose uh, one item each. You couldn't say choose three donkeys if you wanted to, but you could choose a vegetable, a donkey, and a grain. Whatever is going to work for you for that turn. Now, if this was a level three dwarf that I just made, at the end of his expedition, he automatically is going to get upgraded to a level four dwarf. And that will happen each time you go on an expedition up to the maximum of 14. This is another action space where you could go on an expedition. If you placed your token here, you would get all the wood that's in this spot, and then you would be able to go on a level one expedition. So you would get to choose one item from however many uh, options your armor level gives you. So remember that your armor level is different than the expedition level. Expedition level tells you how many items. The armor level tells you what items you may choose from. If you want to have more dwarves, there are a couple things that have to happen. For one thing, you're going to have to have built an additional dwelling on your home board somewhere. Um, there are the standard dwellings, of which there's going to be a large stack, and then there will be some other choices of different types of dwellings, uh, the number of which depends on if you're playing the uh, introductory board or the more advanced board. So if you wanted to make another dwarf based on the choices that you have at the beginning of the game, you could place a token here. You would get either the items that are listed here or you can make another dwarf. So you can't do both in this case. If you wanted to make another dwarf, what you would do is take another token from your supply, so not the other dwarfs that you have that you're playing with, but a dwarf from your supply and put it on top of this one. At the end of the turn, when your dwarves come home, you must have room for that dwarf in your cave. So in this case, there's room for two dwarves in this initial space, plus I've built an extra dwelling, so I can put a third dwarf there. If you make an extra dwarf and you don't have room for it, you don't get to keep it. And obviously there are many choices for acquiring resources during the game. Many of them can be acquired by using these different action spaces. And then there are other cards that are going to come up during the course of the game that will also give you ways to get more resources. Obviously you can also get resources from going on expeditions like I explained earlier. You can also get resources by trading in rubies. So now let's talk about managing animals once you have some different options on your board. Over here we have just a meadow. This is not a pasture. So I'm using two dogs to watch three sheep. This is a large pasture which can hold four animals, so I have three donkeys in there. Up here I have a small pasture which can hold two animals, so I have two cattle. And here I have a large pasture which can normally hold four, but since I built a stable on it, it can hold up to eight, so I have six wild boar here. Now, I also had these two sheep, but I didn't have room for them out in this area. Fortunately, I had room in my house to put my two sheep. Alternatively, you could put the two sheep on this space and put the two cows in here. The basic principle being they have to be the same type of animal. And that's how you can manage the animals. You can move them around your board at any time. Um, however, it's going to best suit you to keep as many animals as you can. So now let's explain the harvest. There is a cheat sheet that will explain how the harvest works but it's really pretty simple. The first stage of the harvest, or phase, is the field phase. During the field phase, you remove the top one of each of your grain and your vegetables, and in some cases, this is gonna leave your field empty. They then go into your inventory and can be used to feed your dwarves, which is the second phase. For each adult dwarf, you must pay two food. 
if that turn you have just produced a baby dwarf, then the baby dwarf only needs to be um, given one food. So in that case, if you had, for instance, two adults and one baby, then you would have to pay five food total. But let's say that you have to pay six in this turn. Down at the very bottom of your home board, there's a little chart that shows you what translates into how much food. For instance, one coin is no food. One dog is no food. You can't eat your dogs. But speaking of dogs that you can't eat, one just walked through my dining room. If you have two coins, then you could buy one food. If you have one wheat that is worth one food, a sheep is worth a food, and a donkey is worth one food. Three coins is worth two food, one vegetable is worth two food, a ruby is worth two food, and a boar is worth two food. Four coins is worth three food, one cattle is worth three food, and two donkeys is worth three food. So you can use this chart to calculate how best to feed your dwarves. This is particularly important in the last turn of the game when you're trying to maximize your points. But in this case, we are flush with a bounty of things with which to feed our dwarves. So we would need to find six food. Well, here's one food because this is a food token. This is worth another food. This is worth two foods, so I'm already up to four. And then I could take, say, one of these boar and use that, and that would be my six food, which I would turn in for that turn. But if you have a lot of these different options, then there are a lot of different ways that you can pay for your food. Generally speaking, you're not going to have this many options. Um, this is just an example. The last phase of the harvest is the breeding phase. Anytime you have two of the same animal, they will breed. In this case, I have one, two, three, four, five sheep. So two pairs of sheep, in other words. So I would create two more sheep. I have one, two, three, four, five boars. So I would create two more boars. I have three cattle, which would allow me to create one more cattle. And I've got two donkeys, which would allow me to create one more donkey. I can only keep the animals that I can house. Now the pigs I can house because I have enough room on this large pasture with its stable. I have enough room for this cattle because this large pasture can hold four of those guys. But as for the sheep and the donkeys, I'm kind of out of luck. This is already a full pasture. These dogs can't watch any more sheep. And these donkeys, well, they're already full. So um, you want to take into account when you're choosing which items to spend for feeding your dwarves, um, which ones are going to be breeding during the next part of the phase. Because you may want to pay with an animal um, that you're just going to be replacing with a breeding phase as opposed to having ones that you have to toss away. And that is the end of the harvest. Now I'm going to set the whole game up and I'm going to show you how the actual play turn works at the very beginning of the game and then as you get a little bit farther into the game. If you think you've got a hold of the rules enough by now, you can stop it here and go try and play it. If you feel like you need some playthrough, then stick around because here it comes. So the table is now set up for a four player game of Caverna. Now I know what you're thinking. But it's going to be okay. Um, I would say the one drawback to this game is that it does take up a lot of room. Uh, if I have a very big table and if we were playing with the full complement of seven players, it would certainly take up most of the table in order to do that. So when you set it up, you're going to set up the board for however many players you have. Like I went over um, in the first part of the video, uh, you use this board, both of these boards for one to seven players, and then the accessory boards, I would call them, are going to differ depending on how many people are playing the game. But there are very similar actions on all of them. Uh, there's nothing that's going to be such a huge surprise that you have no idea how to use that action space. 
um, if you've just watched what I've done already, it's going to make sense. I also set up all the furnishing tiles. So there's the stack of dwellings, and then there's one each of all the other um, tiles that will be available throughout the game. Okay, so we're gonna to need to create a uh, stack of cards that are going to be our round cards that we'll place out um, one at a time during the turns of the game. Uh, and they are all labeled one, two, three, and four for the different stages of the game. And the way I do is I'll take the, four, the, the, the stage four cards first and I'm gonna shuffle them place them down and then I'm going to take the stage three cards shuffle them place them down then I'll do the two stage two cards and I'll shuffle them then you're going to place the special card wish for children on top and you're going to have the wish for children side face up and the urgent wish for children is going to be face down for now and you put that on top of the stage two cards and then lastly you're going to shuffle the stage three cards and put them on top. Uh, you're going to randomly choose a starting player. Um, I've randomly chosen blue as our starting player here. You could roll a die, you could discuss it, um, you can make up an arbitrary rule that's more in keeping to the theme of the game like the shortest person goes first or the person who's most recently been in a cave goes first. It's up to you. Uh, the first player gets one food in their inventory. Uh, the, play for the next player to their left, which would be this person, also gets one food. Then the third player gets two food, and the fourth player gets, oops, gets three food. Each player is going to start with two dwarves in their first open dwelling area. They're also going to get a stack of three dwarves that they will have access to during the game. They will also have three stables, and I recommend putting one of your stables on top of your three dwarf stack to make sure you remember that you don't have access to those dwarves yet. So to start the turn, the first thing we're going to do is take the first card off the top of the deck, and we're going to place it right here. So the first thing that comes up is ore mine construction, uh, which I went over in the first part of the video. Um, it allows you to purchase or build an ore mine, you get three ore, and then you can go on a level two expedition. Because blacksmithing is not out yet, you wouldn't be able to take this action or this part of the action yet um, because you cannot send an unarmed dwarf on an expedition. They need to have an armor of at least one, which they would get from blacksmithing. So you can still take this action, you just can't do the second half of it until blacksmithing comes up. Um, the other thing that I've already done is I've seeded the spaces that need to have um, resources put on them at the beginning of the turn. For instance, excavation needs two stone, and starting player gets one food, ruby mining gets one ruby, and so forth. So that's already done and set up. At the end of this first turn, or this first round, um, we are not going to have a harvest, which is what it says right here on the board. Um, and if you remember, the harvest is when you can collect grain or vegetables from your fields. Uh, it's when you feed your dwarves, and it's also when you breed your animals. So none of that will happen at the end of this first turn. Something to keep in mind. It actually won't happen on the next turn. It'll only start happening at round three. The other thing that I've done is I've taken these little tokens right here. There are seven of them. I mix them all up, and then I randomly place them out on these little markers on the board. Um, they have either a question mark or, um, or a leaf on the back side. Uh, the question mark means that it'll be a different ending to that turn, depending on which question mark has come up. When the first question com mark comes up, there's no harvest. When the second one comes up, you just uh, pay one food per dwarf instead of a harvest. And um, for the third question mark, you can either skip the field phase or the breeding phase and the rest of the harvest is as usual. If you get a leaf, then it's a regular harvest. So, Blue gets to go first and will take his first dwarf and place it out to take an action. So, what he is going to do is he's going to place his dwarf here on sustenance. 
This will allow him to take the grain, put that in his inventory. Um, he can then place a meadow and field tile and he's going to place it right here. And when he does that, he covers up this open space that says plus one food. So he's gonna get plus one food immediately. And now it will be the next player's turn. So yellow will go next. So let's say uh, yellow can go here. We would allow him to take the wood that is on that spot, put that in his inventory, and also place a meadow and field spot. And if he places it in that position, he would get one food. If he places it here, he would not. So he's gonna go ahead and place it here and get one food. Purple is going to choose growth and they are not going to use it to get an additional dwarf because they can't yet. Uh, right now they do not have an additional dwelling. So there's no more room for more dwarves in their caverns. If they took that action at the end of the turn when they have to come home, uh, there's only room for two dwarves. So they would lose the third one. Um, so instead, they're going to take this action that lets them get a variety of um, items. They'll get one wood, one stone, one food, one ore, oops, and two coins. So it just was going to give them some options in the future. It's not a ton of stuff, but it's enough to give them options. Maybe Green is thinking about um, the blacksmith coming up and wanting to go on expeditions in the future, which will require being an armed dwarf, which requires ore. So um, that Green is going to go here and take these three ore. If Green had built an ore mine already, they would get plus two ore for each ore mine that they had in their cavern. But they don't have any, so they just get the three that are there. And now it's back to Blue's turn. So blue is going to choose slash and burn. So they get to place a meadow uh, and field tile. They're going to place it right there. And now they can sow the field with up to two new grain and two new vegetable fields. In order to sow a field, you have to already have um, grain or vegetables in your inventory. Uh, and the blue player has a grain from the previous action that they took, which was over here in sustenance. So they're going to place a grain on the field to sow it. And then the next thing that they will do as part of that action is place two grain on top of it. So when it comes time to harvest, they'll have some grain to harvest. Yellow is going to start working on their cavern. So he takes two stone and he can place one of these cavern tiles. Um, so he's gonna place this here. I placed it over the plus one food tile, so he'll get plus one food. So now he has an additional space where he can build a furnished room. Um, he also has a tunnel, which is a place where you could place a ruby mine or you can add a tunnel next to it to place an ore mine. Purple has some options because they have uh, some goods already. Uh, because of that, they're going to take the action of housework, which will give them one dog, which can hang out around their, uh, their area. And they're also going to get to furnish a cavern, because this is a place that is an open spot to furnish a cavern. In order to furnish a cavern over here, you'd first have to place a cavern down. So because they have some options, they've got one wood, one stone, and one ore. There are a couple of different rooms that would be available for them to purchase. So they're going to spend one stone to build the wood supplier. Now, uh, I'm not gonna go over obviously what all of the furnishing tiles do, but the wood supplier will give you two points at the end of the game, which is noted by this little gold mark here. It's also going to give them one wood at the start of each of the next seven rounds. So it scores at the end of the game and it's going to give them an ongoing bonus. Now I know, again, you're thinking, how am I going to remember to give myself, you know, a, a, a resource item for the next however many turns? The best way to do it is to place those resources out here on the actual board. So that anytime you're placing a card out at the beginning of the next turn, 
you're reminded, oh yeah, this wood needs to go to this person. So now green is going to take a turn and they're also going to go with cavern building. So they get two stone and they get to place down a tile in their cavern and get one food because they placed it on the one food square. So now that everyone has taken their actions, everybody's out of dwarves, the dwarves come home. So you bring your dwarves back and then you would check to see if there is a harvest or a variation of a harvest. Now, as I mentioned before, at the end of the first round, there is no harvest. So we're done for this round. We would now proceed to the next round. Um, so we're going to take the next card and now here we remember oh wood wood is going to go to the person with the wood supplier and we place this place this card down and now blacksmithing is out so now blacksmithing is going to be available for people to pay ore to weaponize <laughs> their dwarves and then be able to send them on expeditions we're also going to reseed all of these areas as determined by that number that's on the corner of the action space as I mentioned earlier, this space has a large two and a, in parentheses, a one. If there was no wood here, we would put two down. But since there is wood here already, we're only going to put one down, which is the number in parentheses. And now we're ready to start the second round. Now I'm going to advance the game a little bit further uh, so you can see what it looks like farther into the game um, when people have more resources to choose from and we have more cards out so there are more action spaces. So here's what things look like a little bit further into the game. People have much more things on their home boards with pastures, crops, uh, they've got d uh, additional dwellings in some cases, they've got some bonus rooms that help them out during the game, and we've got more cards out so there are more actions per turn. I just uh, finished up with round seven. So we were starting round eight and this card came up. This is the family life card. When that card comes out, that's when you flip over the wish for children card to an urgent wish for children. And it changes the action on that card. Now we'll do the other things that you do to prepare for the turn and replenish all of these spaces. And now we can start this round. This player, the yellow player, uh, took one of the actions of getting an additional dwarf. So they have three dwarves where everyone else still has only two. Um, the one thing that they haven't done so far is blacksmithing and going on expeditions. So for this turn, uh, they will choose blacksmithing and then they'll pay one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or which is the maximum that you can pay, which will give their dwarf a level of eight and then they can go on a level three expedition. So anything on this side of the card, they can choose from, um, they can choose three items because it's a level three expedition. So they're gonna choose a stable, which they'll put right there. Uh, they will choose a boar, so another boar will go on that field, and another sheep, there's two sheep down here. But they also have some dogs, so the sheep could go out into one of these pastures if they wanted to. And now the yellow, because he's gone on an expedition, will turn from an eight into a nine because anytime you go on an expedition, your armor goes up by one from the experience gained. And now uh, we have a situation where we've got an armored dwarf and an unarmored dwarf. Whenever you're placing dwarves out on the board, you must place the lesser armored dwarf out first. The only way you can change that is if you play a ruby. If you have a ruby in your inventory and you pay it, you can then play whatever dwarf you want. Otherwise, you have to go in order of how high their armor is. So you couldn't take your highest armored dwarf and immediately put them on an expedition spot. You'd have to pay a ruby to do so. So I have to place this purple marker first. It's actually a lot of rubies to pass up, so I think He'll go there and take a bunch of rubies. And now we will go to the next turn. And again, uh, we have a an eight valued dwarf and a non, uh, no armored dwarf. So that this one has to go out first. 
And let's say he goes here, he takes these items, he places this here, which will give him another bore, but he'll have to make space for it. So he can only have two animals in here. This can only hold two animals, so we'll put the donkeys over here and we'll put the wild boars in this field. And now this player gets to take a turn. Now, if they wanted to go out of order, they could by paying a ruby and play this one first. But um, since, especially since the level three expeditions already been taken, they're not as concerned about it. Um, so they're just going to play in regular order. So the blue player is going to go over here and take all the wood that's located in this area and place this one out, which is going to give him a boar. So he will have another boar in here. So we don't know what's going to happen at the end of this turn, if there's going to be a harvest or not. And you can play it either way. You can either play it so that when you put the card down, you flip this over and you know if it's going to be a harvest or not. Um, I prefer to play it this way, so you kind of have to be prepared for whatever happens. Um, we've already had two of the red question marks come up, so there's only one left out of all of these. And when that happens, uh, the harvest would occur, but you would be skipping either the field or the breeding phase, and that's your choice. But otherwise, the harvest happens as usual. So one of those things will happen at the end of this turn. Yellow is going to go over here and get some wood. And two food. You also have to remember that if you get a stash of rubies going, there are things that you can do with your rubies um, to help you finish off other things that you might want to do. For instance, you can use you can use a ruby to place a single meadow tile or a single field tile. Single, single meadow tile or a single field tile. Um, you can also use it to place a single tunnel tile. So these are things that you could do if you're trying to, um, say, set yourself up for the best success during your turn. If there's something that you want to accomplish and you don't quite have your board set up exactly the way you want, you can fix that if you've got some rubies to spare. For instance, I'm going to have uh, the purple player pay a ruby, and then uh, they're going to use that ruby to lay down a tunnel. And when they do that, now they can take the ore mine construction spot, because now they have a place to put the ore mine down, because it has to go on two adjacent tunnels. So they'll place the ore mine, and it'll be worth three points at the end of the game, it also gives them a place to put their donkey in case they're running out of space for their animals out here. They also get three ore. They also get to take their six armor dwarf on a level two expedition. So anything that is a uh, level six up here, they can choose two items. So let's say for their two items, they choose a boar and a donkey. Um, the boar they'll put with the other boars over here, and the donkey they'll put in this location, uh, in that first cavern. And then this gets upgraded from a 6 to a 7. And now the green player gets to take a turn, and they'll go here and gather some stone, and then place, um, let's have them place a tile here. So our blue guy is going to do something special because he has uh, the space to do it. He is going to do the urgent wish for children spot. He'll place his token here and then he can furnish a dwelling. This is different from this action which is furnish a cavern. Furnish a cavern means you can put any of the tiles in that spot. Furnish a dwelling means you have to put one of these dwelling tiles in, this, in the space that you're building on. You can't use any of the other tiles. Uh, so he is going to pay four wood and three stone to build a dwelling, which will give him three points at the end of the game and room for another dwarf, which is good because he is also uh, going to be getting another new dwarf to add to his family. So we'll put that on top of this one, and that ends that action. And then yellow has one more dwarf than everyone else, so they get one extra turn. 
And they're going to take this spot here, grab a dog, and then furnish a cavern. Um, they're going to do two stone and two wood to purchase the slaughtering cave, which sounds like a really horrible place that I wouldn't want to walk into. Um, but for each farm animal that you convert into food, you get an extra food for that animal. And I'll place it right over here. So it's the end of the turn. Everyone has played their dwarves. So now the dwarves come home. So remember, you have to have room for all of the dwarves that you have. So these guys are all going to come home. And now the blue guys are going to come home and they have made room for an extra dwarf. Now, during the harvest phase, if this is a harvest phase, um, they would normally have to pay two food per dwarf. But since they have a new dwarf, this would only be uh, one food. So they would pay two food for each of these dwarves and then only one food for this one. The best way to remember that that's what you do is to keep them stacked until it's time to uh, pay for their food. Um, otherwise, you can forget that one of them is a baby dwarf as opposed to an adult dwarf. So now that we've done that, we're going to flip this over and see what we get. And it is a harvest, noticed by the little green leaf. So we'll do first the field phase where we take all of our yummy, delicious grain and vegetables off to our inventory. And then is the feeding phase. Uh, so it's uh, two food per dwarf. So this, this, um, this player has three dwarves, so he needs to provide six food. He's got two food tokens. And this is when you want to start thinking about what's going to happen next, which is breeding of the animals. Um, you need to have two animals um, in order to create another animal. Uh, so if you're going to be spending animals to pay for food for feeding your dwarves, you want to think about which ones you use um, because it may affect the results of breeding during the next phase. See, if he does one boar, he has a slaughtering cave. Um, instead of converting into two food, it would convert into three food, so then he would only need one more which can be used or paid with a grain. Green has the cooking cave. At any time, you can convert one grain and one vegetable into five food. So I'm going to do that now. One, two, three, four, five. Normally that would be only worth three food. So I convert that into five food, and then I will use four of those to pay for those dwarves this turn. So I actually come out with uh, one food extra. Now here, like I said, this is a baby dwarf. So you've got two adults, so that would be four food, and then one um, plus one for your baby. During this next phase, these boars are going to breed, and there's no place for them to go. So uh, you might as well use one of the boars, which would be two food. And then you can say we'll do two grain and the two coins. And that will be a total of five food because this is worth one, two, three, four, five. And next we'll have the breeding phase. So over here we've got two boars. So those are going to create one more boar. Um, dogs do not breed uh, in this game. And we've got two sheep, so we're going to get one more sheep, which fortunately I have some extra dogs to watch. Over here I've got three boar, so I'm going to get one more boar. That fills that field up. And I have five sheep, so I'm going to get two more sheep. Fortunately, I have a stable in this pasture, so there's room for them. Now, the donkeys are also going to breed. Um, they do not have to be in the same location in order to breed. You can have your animals spread out. You just have to have the same uh, type within the same area. But even though these donkeys seem far apart, they still manage to somehow breed. And we're going to get another donkey, which I can put right in there. Here we have another donkey. And he can go in one of the mines, uh, put those donkeys to work. And I have three boar, so we're going to get another boar here. Over here, uh, we just used a boar for food, so this boar is just going to hang out by himself. We've got four sheep, so we get two more sheep that will fit in this field because there's a stable there. And that's the end of the breeding phase, that's the end of the turn. We would then start the next round. So you can see there's still a four more rounds to go. Um, at this point, people are going to start thinking about finishing off their boards, putting more tiles down, possibly getting some of these uh, 
furnishings that will give them points at the end of the game. Uh, so to review, let's go over how end game scoring works, even though this isn't how it would look at the end of the game. But let's go over it real quick. So you would get one point for every farm animal and dog. So for instance, on this board, you would get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Um, but you would get minus two for any missing farm animals. This farm does not have any cattle on it, so you get minus two points for not having any cattle. For scoring grain and vegetables, uh, you score the ones that are in your inventory as well as the ones that are in your field. So in this case, I have four grain, one, two, three, four, which are worth half point each. That would give me two points. And I have three vegetables, one, two, three, uh, which would give me three points. I have rubies. Uh, so that would give me three points for uh, each one for each ruby. Two, two dwarves, so you get one point for each dwarf. And then you would count the unused spaces on your board. That's a space where you haven't put down any tiles. Um, so even though this is an empty cavern space, space with no furnishing, you have put a tile down, so that's okay. But all these other spaces, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, would count against you and you get minus 11 points. Then you're going to count for your furnishing tiles, pastures, and mine. So that will be any time you see a gold shield, you would count that. So two, three, uh, each of these pastures is worth four. You're also then gonna get points for what are called parlors, storages, and chambers. And those are the furnishings that I talked about earlier that will give you points at the end of the game. Usually it's points per resource type. Um, there are some other varieties of points that you can get from those uh, parlors, storages, and chambers. Then you would count up any gold that you have and you would subtract any begging markers that you had if you ever were unable to feed your dwarves that turn. And that would be the final score. You total it up. Whoever has the most points is the winner of the game. I hope that you have learned enough to come out and play this on your own. And thanks for visiting the Dragon Table. I will see you next time.